It's an urge. It's an urge. Every champion has felt it. Every king has felt it. Every winner has felt it. Every soldier has felt it. Every victorious person has felt it. The urge to quit. Don't you give up on your dream. I don't care if you don't have the money, you don't have the help, and you don't have the family for it, and you don't have the background for it, and you don't have the friends for it. Don't you give up on your dream. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. It may take you twice as long. You may have to take courses and classes. You might not read as fast. You might not move as quick. You might not have as much, but don't you quit. Through all the things I've gone through in my life, I had a lot of downs. How did I keep the faith? There was a couple of reasons. Number one, I know from living that if you quit whatever you're trying to accomplish, if you quit whatever you were trying to accomplish can never happen. There's not even a remote possibility. If you quit, there is no chance of it popping back up again, coming back later. Quitting is guaranteed failure. Now, when you're trying, you're going to fail. But quitting, just stopping, that was the number one thing I understood. And then number two, you have to make sure that your dreams, your aspirations and goals are so big that not accomplishing them is not an option. And then the other layer of it is, you're probably gonna have to have some suffering to get there or some sacrifice to get there. And so once you've embraced and decided that this suffering, this sacrifice you're making is an indicator of progress, it's an indicator of obsession. Suffering and sacrifice and hard work is an indication of progress towards our dreams. The lack of sacrifice, the lack of suffering in our lives, its removal, its non-existence also equates to a non-existence of a great life a non-existence of a dream happening, a big one anyway. You have to want something so big that it wakes you up in the middle of the night. You have to want something so big that you think about it all the time. You have to want something so big that it drives you to wake up when you don't want to. It keeps you up at night when you long been sleepy. It makes you show up, do things, you wouldn't normally do. It requires extra. If you want to be extraordinary and not ordinary, if you want to be ordinary, live your life. And so embrace the fact that you're going to have to sacrifice and suffer to some extent. Once you've embraced that it's going to happen, it's almost not that bad. It's kind of like those of you that are fit. You've sort of accepted that before you go to the gym and get there, you're going to have to suffer and we go anyway, it becomes a habit. No one goes into a gym thinking, I'm not gonna have to sacrifice or suffer. There'll be no discomfort or no pain. Yet in life, outside of that one area, most of us are worried about suffering. We're afraid of it. it. When we're suffering and sacrificing, we wonder whether it's worth it. We wonder whether we're supposed to. We wonder whether sacrifice or setbacks or suffering is a sign it's not our real dream, don't we? See, at the gym, you'd never think, oh, I'm going through some pain and discomfort. This must be a sign I shouldn't be at the gym. You'd never think that. So while it's happening, there's no part of you that says this isn't right. In fact, the indication of the pain and sacrifice and sweat, don't you feel better at the gym? You're like, wow, I really sacrificed today. I really suffered. So in that area, we all know to the extent we suffer and sacrifice is to the extent we grow. And your body is a metaphor for the rest of your life. But the rest of our life, every time we sweat, every time we sacrifice, every time we suffer, we don't do what we do at the gym. We start saying, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. Maybe I'm not cut out. Maybe it's not my destiny. Maybe I just can't do it. It's the most unbelievable, ridiculous conclusion we draw, but it's what everybody does, which is another form of distraction is doubt. Another form of distraction is just doubt. And doubt comes from the suffer. It comes from a loss. It comes from fear. It comes from the sacrifice. And so just remember this, you're supposed to suffer and sacrifice. So let me ask you a question. 
What are you willing to risk in order to make your dream come true? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. You're going to take a risk. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's a risk of time. Maybe it's a risk at your job. Maybe it's a risk of looking bad. Maybe it's a risk of failing, of falling on your face, of going broke, of going through pain, of going through anxiety. What are you willing to risk in order to win? The price you will pay for not making your dream come true is far greater than the one that you will pay to make it come true. You'll pay that one the rest of your life. And so ask yourself what you're willing to risk. What's the price you're willing to pay? Never give up until however long that is. Step by step, piece by piece, book by book, go for it. Don't miss the chance to grow and resolve that you'll pay the price until you learn, change, grow, become. Then you'll discover some of life's best treasures when you pay that price, that price, that price, that price, that Because what most people do when they're trying to chase their dream or their big outcome, the whole time they're negotiating the price in their head. Should I continue to do it? Is it worth it? I don't know if I can continue anymore. It's getting higher and that price is failure. That price is setback. That price is looking back. That price can be financial, literally a physical price. And what happens is if you don't negotiate that price in advance, it's going to steal your focus and energy and become another distraction. One of the great distractions of chasing our dreams is this thing that goes off in our head as we're negotiating the price we're paying. Is it getting too high? Is it too much? And you'll have people in your ear, it's too big a sacrifice. You're going through too much. And you begin to negotiate it in your mind. It distracts all your focus. You can't be executing and negotiating simultaneously. If you're in your head negotiating and negotiating and negotiating, you can't execute. So negotiate it now. Negotiate it with me now. What are you willing to pay? For me, when I'm after something big, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, I'll sacrifice everything else. But I will not sacrifice anything legal, anything unethical, or anything immoral. But beyond that, I'm gonna get it. And I know that negotiation comes up front, I accept the suffering, I accept the sacrifice, I know the sacrifice is far smaller than the one I'll pay if I don't do it, and I eliminate distractions, and I go freaking get what I want in my life, just like you can, and this needs to be your recipe as well. Successful people don't negotiate the cost of something. They negotiate whether it's worth it. What I'm telling you is if you really want something bad enough, it's worth it. It's worth it. So start to feed yourself the worth question over and over and over again, not the cost question. Cost is a distraction. Worth is a focus mechanism. This is so worth it. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. Focuses you. Cost distracts you. Now, if you don't want to do the extra effort, you finna be regular. There's nothing wrong with being regular. A lot of people are happy being regular. I just wasn't. I ain't want to be regular. If I didn't want no regular house, I didn't want no regular car, I didn't want no regular clothes, I didn't want no regular checking account. I just didn't want it. I wanted to have an exceptional home. I wanted to have an exceptional bank account. I wanted to travel exceptional places. Now, if you don't want that, it's perfectly fine. You can be really happy being ordinary, but if something's burning in you, you got to deal with it. If you don't deal with it, you're gonna be disappointed, man. See, being regular is cool. It's nothing wrong with it. You get a regular job, regular house, regular car, you get regular money, you go on vacation once a year, that's cool. Okay. Economy ticket, regular. See, let me tell you something. You know what you ought to do? Save your money and buy a first class ticket. This is how you train yourself to be successful. Save your money, get an upgrade, buy a first class ticket. Cause when you sit in first class, you're going to understand something. The seats are wider. You get a choice of meals, chicken, beef, or fish. You get a bowl of warm nuts. They give you a hot towel to wipe your hands. Why do you think when their plane take off, they close the curtain to first class. They cannot let you see what the f is going on up there because you're gonna want it back there, but you didn't pay to get it. Hey, what are they doing? They're serving warm nuts. Where's our nuts? Wait a minute. They didn't get charged for the food. Their food was free. They didn't pay for the headsets. They're watching all the movies. Why don't we have that? Because you didn't pay for that. 
So they close the curtain so they don't have to deal with your regular ad. Wondering what's going on in first class. Once you buy a first class ticket, it becomes very difficult now for you to walk past those seats. Because now you're going to know what's going on. So when you treat yourself first class, you are conditioning your mind to now behave and do the things that produce first class results. That's why Dick Gregory said, whenever you can treat yourself first class, you should, because it conditions the mind. Once you fly first class, you never go back. All you gotta do is you can condition yourself. Once you buy a really nice dress, you don't want a cheap dress no more. You want another nice dress. I'm telling you, man, being successful is a mental condition. You can all mentally condition yourself to being successful. All you got is your mind. You in control of it. The body and the mind work together and depend on each other. So they both need attention. There's a Bible phrase that says, treat your body like a temple. So just put it in your notes, body like temple. Not a bad suggestion. Treat your body like a temple, not a woodshed. Now in taking care of the physical, we must learn to be conscious of ourselves, but not self-conscious. We need to be aware of our physical appearance, our physical well-being, but not to the point of being self-conscious. We need to be aware, we need to take care, but some people devote too much of their day to physical appearance. Physical appearance is going to have something to do with your future, your well-being, your income, so do spend some time on physical appearance. How we appear to other people does make a difference in terms of our acceptance and our ability to function and do well in the marketplace. In fact, there's another Bible phrase that says, take care of the outside for people and take care of the inside for God. People look on the outside and God looks on the inside. Now you might believe that people shouldn't judge you by physical appearance. Well, let me give you a clue. They do. Make sure you don't order your life based on shoulds and shouldn'ts. You'll always be confused and you'll always have trouble. The best thing to base your life on is reality. What people really do. So since people generally judge by appearance, then that's probably one thing we want to take care of. That's just part of the game. Now, of course, when people get to know you or if they've been around you any length of time at all, they're going to judge you by more than appearance. But sure enough, people at first are going to take a look. So taking care of yourself in personal appearance is a consideration. Now, physical development also includes your good health and your well-being. You've got to spend some time on that so that you feel good in the marketplace. Get involved in some form of disciplined exercise. Keeping fit and feeling good has a positive effect on your attitude, not just your appearance. Even if you're not into sports, there are some cassette programs and books on how to stay in excellent shape in only 20 to 30 minutes a day. Get the tapes and find your best way to stay physically fit. Just develop a bit of consciousness about taking care of yourself physically. Physical fitness pays great dividends in terms of your energy level, your ability to live a long, healthy life, and your general sense of well-being. The other part of physical well-being is nutrition. There are some excellent cassettes and books on this subject for you to investigate as well. Do all you can to stay fit, to stay healthy, and to stay well, because physical health and fitness affect how you feel about yourself and how you perform in the marketplace. When you feel good about yourself, other people will feel good about you too. Appearance, vigor, vitality, and well-being have a lot to do with how your life works out. That's the physical side. Now, the mental exercise and nourishment are just as important as physical and spiritual exercise and nourishment. You want to make sure that the acceleration of your mental health, mental well-being, and mental capacity keeps up with your physical capacity. So make sure at 40 that your mind has kept up with the passing of the years. Don't stay 30 at 40. Don't stay 30 at 50. Keep up the learning curve with mental exercises. It's so important for you and me to be stretched beyond where we are 
It's too easy to just comfortably sit and stop growing. It often doesn't seem to be that necessary to make the push, to make the effort to learn and to grow and to challenge yourself. But let me give you something to think about. The last few years of the 20th century are going to demand a lot more mental vigor and mental activity. The competition and complications of life are going to truly challenge the full capacity of our mentality. So, stretch your mind. Do you ever think about what you think about? Because if you did, and if you took control of that, you could alter the direction of your entire life. Most people never take the time to take an inventory about their thoughts, yet our thoughts control our world. Our thoughts are like magnets. They literally draw towards us that which we obsess about. And so most people never take the time to analyze what they think about. The most successful people I know are the most self-aware, meaning they're aware of what they do and they're also aware of what they think, they're aware of how they're perceived. So today's message is about thinking. So here's some stats you need to know. Number one is, Average person, you and I have about 75,000 thoughts a day rattling around in this thing we call our brains and our minds, 75,000 of them. The crazy thing is 91% of those thoughts are identical to the previous day and are identical to the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. And then we wonder why our life seems to repeat itself over and over again. So really the difference in our life, if we have 75,000 thoughts a day, here's the crazy thing, 91% of them are exactly the same. The separation in our life is in those 9% of their thoughts because remember this, these magnets are pretty powerful. That's why I'm always saying that your obsessions become your possessions because they do. You draw into your life exactly what it is you think about. It's a physical reality that you attract to yourself what you think about. So the difference in our life is 9% of our thoughts. That's why people say all the time the difference between winning and losing is so small it's almost too scary to talk about and really we've identified what it is. It's 9% of what we think about alters the direction of our life. So what I'm here to tell you today is you've got to hone in and get aware of what you think about and then alter those 9% of the thoughts that are variable on a daily basis to serve you. Because if you don't, these thoughts become like viruses. They're viruses in our mind. What happens in a computer when it gets a virus? It slows down, it becomes sluggish, it doesn't function at its optimal level. Same thing with our thinking. If we don't get those 9% of our thoughts to serve us, our lives go in a completely different direction. So remember this, you don't see things in your life as they are. You see things in life as you are. And so the more you alter you, the more you begin to see things differently. What's is amazing about this is we control who we are by what we think about. Think about this just for a second. Wherever you're sitting watching this, the chair that you're sitting in, if you're sitting in a chair, if you're driving in a car and you're listening to this, that seat you're in started in someone's mind as a thought, right? Every detail of it, the fabric, the cushions, the way it's structured, every single piece of that started in someone's mind as a thought and then became a reality by putting out the pieces together. See, everything in life is that way as well. It always begins with a thought. When we think a new thought, here's what literally happens. Thinking a new thought literally opens a space up in our minds, in our lives, that never existed before prior to having that thought. It's like a brand new space you've created just by thinking it. And what happens is your subconscious and subconscious mind goes to work on filling in that space with the people, places, resources, and things to fill it up like a room in an architect would, to fill up that space and fully furnish it. That's the power of how we think. So literally everything that exists started as a thought in someone's mind and then became a material matter. And so you've got to begin to think about the things you want to materialize in your life on a regular basis and think about it repetitiously. Literally the things that we obsess about become the things that we possess in our lives. Most people, those variable 9% of the thoughts is the new thing they're worried about, the new fear they have, the new response to an email they have to make, and they never dictate the terms. Remember this, your mind is a weapon and you gotta begin to use it and pick that weapon up and control it. Most people are out of control with their mind. They don't point it at something. They let the world point it and they miss fire all the time. Get back up. That's what life is about. Get knocked down, but not stand down. Taking in that air, breathing in that life, but having the ability to getting back up. Circumstances are happening every single day in people's lives. And some things they just don't have control over. Not you, not me, not anyone. But nevertheless, we must have the ability to get up. You can be rejected. You can feel alone. Your relationships are bad. Things are not working out the way you want them to work out. But you still have to have the ability to get up. 
You must be strong enough and willing enough to understand the circumstances that are happening in your life must happen and it will happen, but you don't stop going forward. You don't let distractions or anything disrupting your ideas and your dreams in your life. Your life is beautiful. Regardless of the hurts, regardless of the setbacks, regardless if you get knocked down, you've got to have the ability to get up. A lot of people want to give up. A lot of people are hopeless. But what are you? Are you going to fit in that category? Do you feel that you need to be that type of person? Do you feel that you are hopeless? Or do you have enough faith and enough hope within your heart and your soul to carry on? Don't give in to the circumstances that you feel that are holding you down. Sometimes you got to go through the pain so you can understand what a real victory is all about. A lot of people want easy. A lot of people want to celebrate a victory. But what victory have you earned if you haven't suffered? Don't be that individual. Stand on what you got to do and go after it. Being knocked down. How many times have we heard, I'm at the end of my rope? How many times have we heard, I don't have any hope? How many times have we heard, I don't have no faith? How many times have we heard, I can't? How many times have we heard, I'll try it? How many times have we heard, I can't? You can't, can't do nothing for you anyway. So why hold on to it? Why believe in it? Why trust in it? Why give can't so much power? Why give excuses so much power? Why can't you just hide the fact and understand that there's something that is unique and beautiful about you? This morning, I want to talk to you from the subject, there's nothing as powerful as a changed mind. <laughs> there is nothing as powerful as a changed mind. You can change your hair, your clothing, your address, your spouse, your church, your residence. But if you don't change your mind, the same experience will perpetuate itself over and over again because everything outwardly changed, but nothing inwardly changed. Every, every idea you have, every mindset you have, your way of thinking, that's what your philosophy is. Your way of thinking is going to bear fruit. How you think about a thing is going to determine your whole life. How you think about a thing determines how you live. If you want to change the way you live, you got to change the way you think. You are the reflection of your thinking. You are the character of your mind. The life you live today is a, a, a manifestation of the inner workings of your mind. And that controls how people perceive you and how people relate to you on a regular basis. There are too many people who don't know the importance of the mind. The mind is a massive tool for our benefit. That mind is, is like the rudder that directs the ship. See, for your spirit, your mind is so important. If you turn your mind away from what you're supposed to be focusing on, your feeling would die. Can you see that? For whatever it is, your emotions for it. You need your emotions, your feelings, everything must come together and your mind is responsible for doing that. So you start by channeling your mind to your purpose. You set your mind. Your mind helps you channel all the forces of your spirits in the direction of that focus. So you use your mind, you set your mind. 
You have to fix the mind before you can bestow the blessing because until they get their mind right, everything you invest in them is going to leak out of the crevices of a mind that refuses to change. Look at your neighbor and ask him, do you have a mind to change? Wait for an answer. If they say no, drag them to the altar. Tell them they got till midnight to get that fix. They've got till midnight to, to dump out all jealousy, all pettiness, all unforgiveness, all strife, all malice, all confusion, all blaming other people for your mistake. You got till midnight to get rid of every poison that's hindering you, every inflexibility that's stopping you from what God is about to pour into your life. Woe be unto you if you go into another year and waste another year with the old mentality while somebody's in the hospital begging God for the opportunity that you have right now. You better step into this moment. Well, what kind of philosophy is the enemy going to use to rob you of something you already have? Vain deceit, tradition of men, Christmas, Easter money, all of that is to the Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, <laughs> sure, that that temptation, those tests, those trials, they keep showing up because you won't allow the transformation to take place by renewing your mind. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us, and then they drag us away. And verse 15 says, these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Well, God wants all of that to be dealt with by renewing the mind, but God can't come and renew your mind for you. You've got to be willing to cooperate with God. You know, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, works on the inside of us and he changes our desires to to do what pleases God and gives us the power to be able to do that. And I think the idea is, is that, you know, as Christians, we just chill out and just don't do anything. But that's why he talked about dedication first. Can you dedicate yourself to this? I mean, something happens when you renew your mind with the word. Now, I understand what, what it feels like when you're, you're, you're trying to renew your mind with the word, but you're, you're not getting the right teaching. And then the teaching becomes condemning and, and it becomes, it's, it's shaming you and all that. Well, that's, that's not, it's not being rightly divided. But when you get an understanding of how to rightly divide the word and you start letting it renew your mind, it brings freedom. And all you want to do is do what's right. You're not, you're, you're going to be more into doing what pleases God and less into doing what pleases you when you begin to really understand the gospel. And so when our minds are renewed by the word of God, and I say the word of God, I've got to be very precise, the word of God or in the New Testament or, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead, the word of God was that word of grace. And, and, and I'm specifically talking about renewing your mind with that word of grace so that it can bring you to a place you've never been before. When that happens, we will overcome negative desires and we will live in God's perfect will for our lives. Now, renewing the mind is more than learning. It's changing. Give me a new mind means give me a new perspective. Give me a new perspective. Give me a new way of looking at my situation. Give me a new way of looking at my circumstances. Get my mind ready for this year because when I get this year, there's going to be blessings. There's going to be miracles. There's going to be opportunities. Oh, yes, there's going to be some struggles. There's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some tests. But even the struggles are an opportunity for me to show off the victory if my mind can handle the change do you have the mindset to be blessed you have to decide to be blessed you have to decide you know what this is a day that the Lord has made I will rejoice 
and be glad that I will rejoice. I, as an act of my will, I've decided I'm going to rejoice. I made up my mind. I'm going to be happy. I made up my mind. I'm going to enjoy. I'm as healthy as I'm going to be. I'm as young as I'm ever going to be. I can't get any younger. I can't roll the clock back. What with what I got left, I'm going to maximize this. I will rejoice. See, that's, that's getting on somebody's nerves right now because that old mind can't rejoice. No, not me. I can't rejoice. I'm still angry. I'm not going to rejoice till they apologize. I'm not going to rejoice until he leaves that other woman. I'm not going to rejoice until my children appreciate me. You are wasting time. You have to let the past go and step over into the future and say, I I will rejoice. So you understand, it, there's this principle again, that's going to be very difficult for the grace of God to have anything to do in the life of a person who has a, 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 a high uh, or exaggeration of his own self-importance, because it'll be by the grace of God. But we cooperate with him by renewing our mind in that word. And we cooperate with, with the spirit of God. So most people... They become Christians and they still remain conformed to the world and all of the world's failure and all of the problems until they renew their mind. That's something I want you to you hear. I, I hope it's something that's a uh, light bulb's coming on like, oh, wow. So no wonder I'm still the same. Most people become Christians and still remain conformed to the world and all of its failure and problems until until they renew their mind here's my question tonight are you still renewing your mind renewing the mind is not a a a one-time event and i'm going to say that over and over again it's a lifetime process so it's not well i've renewed my mind if you if you can say i've renewed my mind you're in trouble because it's it's got to be a continuous renewing of the mind to keep you uh, from being conformed to the ways of the world. The devil doesn't mind you coming to church. <laughs> the devil doesn't mind you singing in the choir. The devil doesn't mind if you preach. The devil doesn't mind if you shout all over the church. The devil only minds if you change your mind. Now you may be born again, on your way to heaven, but at the present time, you're living in hell on the earth. Why? Because you're still conformed to this world. You're still fashioned and, and molded and controlled by the ways of this world. And if you're still depressed and if you're still afraid of life circumstances and you're still treating your spouse badly and you're still struggling in poverty. You're still having to see, uh, uh, you, you're still having to, uh, to, 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 to adjust certain things that you used to do when you were not saved. You're still having sex with someone who is not your, 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 your spouse or somebody you're married to. You're still caught up in pornography. You're still mad at the world and then though you may be born again you're still conformed to the world and that's why all that happens if you're still doing something that you thought that getting born again would stop i'm telling you that's not how it happens you can get born again and don't renew your mind and you'll still be caught up in the conforming conforming to the ways of the world and that's what that's all about that's why people keep doing that because they have not understood the importance of the word of god and renewing their mind with god's word we keep doing our best to try to throw the bible away and say it's just no good and i'm telling you it is the very uh essence that god has provided to us as christians for change and transformation in our lives.
everything that's inflexible and everything that's not ready and everything that's backwards and everything that's negative and everything that's condescending and everything that's carnal and everything that's holding me back. I refuse to take it over into another year and waste another new year with an old mind. The devil is a lie. You can get your family out. You can get your job out. You can get your career out. You can get your health out. You can get your prosperity out. If you can get your mind out, no devil in hell, no weapon formed against you, no enemy that hates you, no witch that hexes you can stop you from being free. If you can get your mind out, grab yourself by the head and say, we're coming out of this. Jeremiah 4.14. He says, oh, Jerusalem, watch your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your, your, your in, iniquitous and grossly offensive thoughts huh, lodge within you? You know what he's saying? There's no change until you begin to change the way you think. There's no change until you begin to change those, those, those thoughts that are, that are in your mind. Look at James chapter one, verse 13 through 15, because I know I'm challenging people, but listen, it, this is, this is all Bible. This is all scripture. You know, they're always going to be somebody to say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, just because you don't agree with the Bible, you're still trying to find a way to justify, you know, what you're doing and how you're living. And you're still trying to change the word instead of allowing the word to change you. So what it boils down to. Is this the battleground between God and the enemy, between right and wrong, between success and struggle, between destiny or that which is derogatory, is fighting for your mind. Because in your mind are your default settings. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you don't change it in your head, you can't change it in your life. I don't care whether it's losing weight. I don't care whether it's going after a job. I don't care whether it's being faithful and committed. I don't care whether it's being honest and true. It has to change up here or it won't change anywhere else. There is nothing as powerful as a change my <laughs> Our environment, our associations, the fact that we were born in sin, we have a predisposition to be defaulted to depravity. Our circumstances all around us affect our default. The culture is nothing over Christ. Culture is an agricultural term which simply means that which is planted has been encouraged to grow. And some things have been planted in you that have been encouraged to grow. The question is, are you willing to allow a new truth to be planted in place of past experiences and thereby change your mind or will you be imprisoned to live a future of weakness or ignorance or evil or fear not because you don't want to be better Esau wanted his birthright he never got it back because he was unsuccessful at changing his mind excellence shows itself be excellent let Excellence be your brand. Everybody talks about building a brand. I never even knew what that was. When people say you're a brand, I would say, no, I'm just Oprah. What I recognize now is that my choice to in every way, in every example, in every experience to do the right thing and the excellent thing is what has created the brand. And what I know is that when you are excellent, you become unforgettable. People remember you. You stand out. Regardless of what it is, you become an unforgettable woman. And that is what we all want. We want to be unforgettable 
and not forgettable. So doing the right thing, even when nobody knows you're doing the right thing, will always bring the right thing to you. I promise you that. Why? Because the third law of motion is always at work. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That is so true in all of our lives. You just have to do the right thing and the right thing will follow you even when people don't support it. I remember many times on my show, there are many shows y'all never saw. And the reason you didn't see them is because I got the last vote. You have the power to go out in the world and inspire people, even if you clean a toilet, clean the toilet like Picasso painted. You have the power to do that. You have the power to use your work as a chance to birth creativity into your world and to uplift other people. You have the power to do your part to change the world. And that's really what this video is about. It's about success. It's about doing genius level work. It's about making your dreams come true. And I want to give you some simple ideas on it. Number one, the number one reason we don't achieve success and we resign ourselves to mediocrity and we get swallowed into failure and discouragement and it becomes sometimes so deep that we can't see the possibilities that our lives could be. I mean, your life doesn't have to be your current life 30 days from now, but most people can't see that. And the number one reason is this word called grit. Researchers say the number one defining factor of whether we become successful or average is whether we have grit. Grit is the ability to stay true to your vision and not dilute it when you get laughed at. Grit is the ability to try an innovation, experience failure, and to say, I'm going to continue and I'm actually going to learn and use that experience to get me closer on my path to the mountaintop. I mean, what the ordinary person sees as failure, the master simply sees as part of the process of refining your craft. So number one, you've got to have grit. You've got to literally, when you get knocked down, force yourself to get back up because then you start to develop a new brain. Yes, you develop a new neural pathway. Yes, you develop new muscle memory. And yes, you develop confidence. Remember that every time you get knocked down, it's an opportunity for you to develop more confidence, develop more experience, develop more inner power. Okay, every time you do something that you didn't feel like doing, like getting back up after you failed, uh, failed or staying true to yourself after you've been laughed at or told it can't be done, literally, you become more powerful. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control, where something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. Because the whole nature of the Godhead, according to this idea, is to play that he's not. The first thing he says to himself is man get lost because he gives himself away. The nature of love is self-abandonment, not clinging to oneself, throwing yourself out, as in, for example, in basketball, you're always getting rid of the ball. You say to the other fellow, have a ball, see? And uh, that, that keeps things moving. That's the nature of life. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality, not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is. And you're all that, only you're pretending you're not. I do not live my life in the confines of what anybody says. I let my imagination go, and now imagination is a preview to life's coming to track. But what that really means is, is God showing you a preview of what he has for you. So now, if you have not cause you ask not, do you understand if you up your ass, he has to up his gear? This period, this is simple stuff that anybody can apply. You ain't even gotta have no degree to do this. You don't even have to have no money to do this. You can start this today and change your whole game because you're going to need grace and favor anyway. Now, I ain't no preacher, but I, people kill me when they ask me. I was talking to a group of, of white reporters the other day. They kept asking me, how did I make it? I kept talking about grace and favor. And they kept asking me, who is your agent? I don't know what Who the, who? Y'all, why you skipping over what I'm trying to tell you? You 
need the dream, the faith, and then he put his grace and favor on top of you gone. But you got to ask for something. If you up your ass, he got to up his gill. Period. You have not cause you ask not. Quit asking God for little bitty stuff. Lord Jesus, help me make my rent. Don't he always? All y'all got somewhere to stay. How about this? Why you keep asking for rent? Why don't you ask for a mortgage? If he gonna give you the money for a place to stay, what difference do it make to God? But if you keep saying rent, ain't he fair? He keep giving you rent. If you ask for a mortgage, he'll give you a mortgage. But you have not cause you ask not. Lord Jesus, help me fix my car so I can make it to work. Why do you keep praying? Talking about past and future and excessive emphasis on past and future in your life. Yes, of course you need to have, it. there's nothing wrong with having a certain intention of what you want to achieve take steps towards it it's it's part of living here in this dimension you can't just say i'm never going to plan anything anymore just take life as it comes well some people try to do that but they're not that happy either after a while <laughs> uh, so then your life will get very diffused and so to have an intention to have to make a plan perfectly fine what either a short-term plan like i'm going to meet you tomorrow at four o'clock how would you ever meet anybody if we didn't have time and and future on a practical level of course it's needed the question is whether future takes over your mind being able to use it for practical purposes is of course great but i call that clock time is fine but psychological time is when the future takes over your mind and your entire thought patterns are geared only towards future and you treat the present moment as either just a means to an end because it enables you to get to the next one you're always reaching out so to speak internally to the next yet never quite here always looking for some fulfillment there so you can never embrace the fullness of now or you make the now into even an enemy some people are always unhappy you perhaps we all know some one or two people like that three <laughs> we all, who are wherever they are they are they're complaining it's never quite right wherever they are or whoever they are with after a little while they're very uncomfortable again that it should be somewhere else you know the bumper sticker that you see in some cars in you know, various versions of it says i'd rather be golfing and then another one says i'd rather be fishing i'd rather be this i'd rather be there when i visited the the spiritual teacher ram das who lives in hawaii uh, he has a bumper sticker on oh, but ram das was the person who in the 70s wrote the book be here now that and anyway he has a bumper sticker on his car that says i'd rather be here now what it is to be successful success doesn't take vacation ask yourself this how many champions have you seen in your lifetime or do you know any champion perhaps maybe you were a champion at one time in your life but you took a vacation see the thing about champions is that there are very few of them but there are many more people that do not understand the significance of what it means to apply significant hard work and to be able to get the hard work in and being able to persevere in their lives.